From Microbe TV, this is TWIP, This Week in Parasitism, episode 149, recorded on March 20th, 2018. And Rack and Yellow, and joining me today here in New York City, Dixon de Pommier. Hello, Vincent, and happy spring. Well, today is spring. Today is spring. But it's going to snow tonight, right? This is all true. Also joining us remotely, <laughs> Daniel Griffin. Hello, everybody. Hey, Daniel. And we have a guest right here in New York City. We promised this last time. We Daniel did. said we will have a guest on the next show to unveil our case. He is from right here at Columbia University That's right. Medical Center. Shivang Shah, welcome to TWIP. Thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me onto the show. I'm a big fan of the podcast. Well, this may not be your last time then. <laughs> really? You, uh, you've heard the show before? Uh, since uh, Daniel introduced me to yeah, cool. a couple months ago, so recent fan, but nice. um, a convert, and I'm trying to Lovely. proselytize <laughs> as I can. Well, we just gave you a free book, so you're you're ensconced in our uh, uh, <clears throat> small world of uh, possessors of the hard copy. How's that? <laughs> I feel very honored. <laughs> so you are currently a pediatric infectious disease doc here at Columbia, correct? Yes. Um, I'm a, in my first year of training, clinical training as a pediatric infectious disease fellow. Huh. And uh, as part of my research, I actually study lung injury and severe malaria. Oh, uh, really? Nice. Oh, wow. And uh, where were you before here? Uh, for medical school, I was at Mount Sinai and I did my PhD um, between Oxford and the NIH, um, again, studying really? severe malaria nice. and host susceptibility. Who, do you, who were you with down at uh, NIH? Uh, I was with Tom Wellams at NIH. Oh, he's fantastic. And uh, Dominic Kwiatkowski at um, Oxford. Nice. Did you get to meet Bob Gwads by any chance? I did, yes. He was a uh, <laughs> catty corner away from my desk. Fan- I see so his name in, on the book. You're on the inner circle of the fellowship here. <laughs> well, he said he's from Mount Sinai also, which is yeah. where I got my PhD. I, this is too... So what is this? Many degrees of separation. None. Zero. None, zero. <laughs> and where, where are you from originally? I'm from upstate New York, just a couple hours north of New York City. Um, nice. It's a little town called Middletown. Middletown. Every state that. has to have one. I know Middletown. It's nice. on the way to the Beaver Kill River. Yes. That's exactly right. Dixon, I was at a Drew, Conf- Drew University conference, and I met an undergrad. I said, where are you from? He said, Goshen. He said, you probably never heard of it. I said, yeah, I drove oh. to Cornell often. I drove right past Goshen. <laughs> Isn't there good fishing in Goshen? No, but they have a harness racing in Goshen. <laughs> no, okay. The harness racing museum is in Goshen. <laughs> okay. Well, welcome to TWIP. Hope you'll be back. And we have the first order of business is to have the guesses for this case, which Daniel borrowed from you. He presented it, but since it's yours, why don't you tell us, uh, give us a recap of what's going on here. That's right. This was a female teenager that I first met in January uh, who lives in New York City, uh, is previously healthy, and came in with a rash for two weeks that was quite itchy, as well as this abnormal, painful feeling in her legs. She initially had an upper respiratory tract infection, but no cough or fever. The rash is itchy, worse at night, uh... She complains of a pins and needles and sharp stabbing sensation in her feet and her legs. In the ER, she was first told that it was zoster and started on gabapentin, but a few days later, she had some low-grade fevers, and the pain was getting worse, and so she ended up being admitted to the hospital. Uh, No prior medical or surgical history, type 1 diabetes in her aunt, dad had migraines, no autoimmune disease history, and she lives with her parents and younger brother in New York City. Uh, a lot of different travel, including to Holland and Hawaii most recently, um, and does have a pet lizard at home. <laughs> There's a red herring if I ever saw one. <laughs> uh, and in Hawaii, um, where she was about three weeks prior to coming to our hospital, she had eaten a salad that no one else had eaten, um, she thinks, um, but also um, had a few bites of her dad's sushi. Um, on physical exam here, um, she was febrile, um, had a high heart rate. Um, and had a normal blood pressure, um, but really was in excruciating pain and didn't want to move because of the pain. Um, She had an irregular rash on her chest, neck, back, and abdomen. Um, At this point, by the time we saw her, a lot of the rash had actually resolved. And on her laboratory tests, she had a white count that was normal, 
not much of a shift to the left, uh, had a slightly elevated sedimentation rate at 24, and her lumbar puncture was notable for increased white cells of 280, and 32% of those were eosinophils. Right. Another red herring, but in this case, <laughs> mm-hmm. probably an appropriate red a herring. Relevant red herring. <laughs> That's right. All right, we had a number of guesses. Jerry wrote <clears throat> Trinella Spiralis, Trichinella. <laughs> yeah, that's what he meant. I'm sure he did. Question mark. Paul writes infection with rat lungworm, Angiostrongulus cantonensis. And let me read the next one, and then I will move on to someone else. Chris writes, Dear Twipsters, several of the patient's symptoms suggest CNS involvement and the eosinophilia found by lumbar puncture. Help me narrow down possible causes being possibly indicative of eosinophilic meningitis. A few parasitic nematodes are closely associated with this condition, and the patient's recent visit to Hawaii implicates one in particular, Angiostrongulus cantonensis, the rat lungworm. Humans or incidental hosts can acquire infection by consuming L3s and slugs and snails with symptoms arising when the worms die in the meninges. Given her history, the salad is likely to blame. That's a good title. <laughs> right. Diagnosis. Blame it on the salad. <laughs> diagnosis cannot be made directly, so her symptoms and history must suffice. Disappointingly, no specific treatment suggested, so she would need to wait for the infection to resolve on its own, typically two to eight weeks. But during this time, serious neurologic sequelae and death can occur. Very interesting parasite, but this neurotropism is kind of sobering. As an odd counterpart to the earthworm story you related in the last episode, this lungworm has been contracted from the socially motivated consumption of slugs. <laughs> Looking forward to your thoughts, Chris in Athens, Georgia. I like the wording, socially motivated. <laughs> yep, exactly. Like a dare. Dixon. <laughs> uh, okay. <clears throat> Peter writes, um, a, uh, hmm. a shared. A shared twip. Interpretation, please. It's a good to good friends. It's, oh, okay. All right, that's fine. It's, uh, it's yeah. Gaelic or Irish, right? <laughs> it's as we learned. Irish. Oh, yeah. well, it's it's appropriate. It's around St. Patrick's Day. After my long email episode, I will be nice to Dixon and endeavor to keep them shorter. To investigate this case study, I was joined by Gwen Disliper, Paula Tierney, Rachel Byrne, and couldn't be there, but sent her my thoughts by email. Lots of symptoms and a detailed case history given, originally making us feel despondent as our list of possible important factors grew longer and longer. One thing stood out, a suspect salad in Hawaii. It made us think of angiostrongulus, angiostrongulosis, or rat lung disease caused by the parasite angiostrongulus cantonensis. We searched the literature, and one by one we were able to tick off the symptoms, itchy rash on chest, back and abdomen, waning pins and needles, and worsening stabbing pain, febrile, painful, and slow movement of extremities, 32% eosinophilia in the cerebrospinal fluid, and higher than usual levels of proteins, all symptoms linked to angiostrongulosis. Our despondency turned to euphoria. That, of course, does not mean we were right, but we did have a nice parasitic journey of discovery. Diagnostic tools seem still under development, but we did find reports of some success carrying out PCR on the cerebrospinal fluid. Supportive treatment should be carried out using some success. Um, let's see, using antihelminthic treatment is controversial due to fears of complications caused by dying worms. Infection most likely via ingestion of a small a snail or a slug in the salad, most likely via the invasive semi-slug. Oh, Pamarian uh, maritensis. Prevention by thoroughly washing hands, fruits, and veg, and properly cooking peritonic hosts, such as frogs and shrimp. <laughs> also increased biosecurity to stop more reservoir hosts arriving in ecological based pest management to keep those already present in check. Also, of course, further findings for Paula and I. Funding. I'm sorry. And also, of course, further funding (laughs) for Paula and I. That's important. (laughs) Who work on parasites and bioinvasion systems. Oh, interesting. Interestingly, just last week, Rachel found a different angiostrondula species in some badger lungs. It was interesting as although it had been frozen for six months, then thawed and refrozen, the larvae were still alive. Check out the video that they sent. Um, best to be sure to flash freeze your sushi shrimp and not just freeze it. Finally, I would like 
I would have taken part in this schisto infection program. Although not intentionally infected, I did catch Pumula hantavirus. Is that correct, Vincent? Is that getting... Pumala so Hunt- one Pumala yeah. Yeah, two two U's actually right P U M U U L A Pumula okay Pumula I knew through my work with bank voles in Finland there was a high risk of infection but low risk of serious virulence I had better odds than I did each time I got into my car <laughs> and that's from um, Peter. You know, the, I'm at this oh, video. His, I'm sorry. There's a PS. The video is impressive. It's very cool. <laughs> I would like to look at it. We are going to post it, of course. It's this wiggling. Yeah, yeah. We can, you know what? We could put it on the courses also. We have a, an Angiostrangula segment. You can't have it. You can't have it. Oh, I want it, please. <laughs> yeah, you, you, have this, you have this video up, too. Yeah. Do you see this, Daniel, this video? You know, I didn't, I didn't watch it, actually. Just click okay. on it. It's just a short uh, Twitter video. You know, it's six seconds. Yeah. But it's the beautiful one with live larvae inside, and there's one... Right. I guess oh, that's like not. they are incredibly difficult to kill. P.S. Hope it is okay to plug a recent blog post for the Royal Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene by Gwyn on Ascaris entitled Wormy People Why Some People Are Wormier Than Others. Hmm, this yeah. is lovely. It just goes to show this video has like 400 views. <laughs> I can never get that kind of viewing on Twitter. You got to have worms in your Twitter post. Exactly yeah. right. Clearly. Exactly right. Clearly. Daniel, can you take the next one? I, I can. I, I'm busy looking at the Ascaris worms, but no, no, I will go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. What is this? Oh, sorry. The ask, Why some people are wormier than others. Yeah. What's, yeah, I don't know if you guys clicked on that. Yeah, I did. What's the answer? It's got to be genetics. Let's see. Let's see. So it's saying here, wormy people, a minority of people are heavily infected and have severe symptoms. And I guess so it's showing certain people, um, talking about children, right? The youngest that we've discussed this 5 to 15 carry the heaviest um, Worm burdens. And oh, uh, they're talking our lab in Trinity College, Dublin, is particularly interested in this phenomenon. Yeah, that's and weird. so, this, uh, this is like the financial thing like 20% of the world's population is 80% of the worm burden. Yeah. Yeah, this is from uh, the same place as Peter is writing from. Exactly. And there are two lovely posters here hmm. on this presentation. Very nice. Cool. Thank you. All right. Yeah, Daniel. that's great stuff. All right. So Eric writes, dear TWIP hosts, my guess is Angiostrongulus cantonensis, the rat lungworm. I first thought about Loeffler's syndrome with Ascaris and Strongyloides, which you mentioned earlier in the podcast, both involve larvae migrating through the lungs. The neurological findings had me stumped and mulling over whether the lesion was in the lower spinal cord or somewhere equivalent and perhaps caused by neurocystis sarcosis, which I hadn't heard of in Hawaii, I decided I'd review all the nematodes when I finished driving home. (laughs) Then the information about eosinophils in the lumbar puncture came along. Since the causes of eosinophilic meningitis are few, the clue had me fixated on searching precisely that term when I got home. There's a twist. I actually grew up in Hawaii. Oh, wow. Facebook posts from friends back home are a large chunk of my homepage feed, including articles in the local news a while back. And then we have <laughs> brackets here. Sandwiched by appropriate emojis and hashtags about a terrifying sounding disease, rat lungworm which has emerged over the past few years on contaminated greens. Mm -hmm. Given the recentness of the patient's case and my gut instinct that most helaminthiases are very rare in Hawaii and the patient's other developed world destination, I wondered if there could be a connection. Uh, It was too much to resist, so upon parking my car, I looked up rat lungworm instead of eosinophilic meningitis. To my astonishment, I found that (laughs) angiostrongulus is indeed the most common parasitic cause of eosinophilic meningitis. Is it also the most common cause even in the USA? Question mark. I feel quite bad for our patient to have contracted this disease, especially in my beautiful and otherwise generally safe home state. (laughs) And I wish her a speedy and complication-free recovery. (laughs) Eric Los Angeles, and he gives us a link to the Hawaii news story. Hmm. Yeah. So I don't know if you guys, <clears throat> yeah, I see if you guys open that up, um, but there's rat lungworm disease spreads fear across Hawaii. Well, that's not a new cases. that's not a new headline because, as I was saying to um, our guest before we went on the air, that there's a guy by the name of Ali Kata who's now retired, who made his living describing epidemics in Hawaii from uh, from presumably 
maybe, perhaps, what this patient is suffering from. So they've been aware of it for some time now, I think. It's a 2015 article. Right. Yeah. 40, 42 cases. Since, 42 cases. It's a lot. Well, since 2007, right? Yeah. And yeah. probably more now. That's right. All right. The next one is Mick. Mick writes, Dear Twipperoos, I am a family doctor from Darwin, Australia. I came across your podcast while studying the Diploma of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene in Liverpool last year. I listen to your podcast most weeks while I do the washing up. I was most interested in the brief mention of eating garden worms at the beginning of last podcast. You may have heard the story of a rugby player in Sydney who acquired rat lungworm from completing a dare to eat a garden slug. <laughs> hmm. Sadly, he developed eosinophilic meningitis, and several years down the track, he's basically in a vegetative state. Oh, dear. Oh. Parentheses, the case has recently come back into light as the government assistance package for him is being reduced. My veterinarian wife tells me that this type of worm is only prevalent mainly in the temperate parts of Australia, mm. but perhaps that is just where they've been tracking it. Interestingly, a brief Google search to a veterinary article indicates that the inebriated adult male on a dare e.g. on a buck's night, is not an isolated incident, at least in Australia. <laughs> Do you know the rates of infection in countries like Australia and also in Southeast Asia? Mm. And then there's a link to an article for yeah. a teenager who swallowed a garden slug as a dare. I, I remember some um, reports from uh, New Orleans and the environs of New Orleans that they had cases there too, so... Uh, it may have come in, of course, as a result of um, a ship talking from Australia, or Hawaii, rather, bringing with them their salad ingredients. Yeah. David writes, Dear hosts, I believe the teenager from New York City is suffering from scabies infection from the mite Sarcoptes scabii. The mites burrow into the skin to live and reproduce. Their presence causes an allergic reaction. To me, the smoking gun lay in the clue that the itching became worse at night, a common trait in scabies infection. This reaction to the mite builds over time, and there is a typical delay of four to six weeks between the infestation and the onset of itching. Furthermore, even after the mites are eradicated, symptoms may persist for one or more weeks after treatment. As scabies is a common condition found across the globe, it might be difficult to pinpoint exactly where she was infested, but she might be able to trace back to the original site if she remembers where she was four to six, six weeks before her symptoms mm -hmm. began. She might also have contracted these mites from her dog, as they have been known to transmit the mites as well. Treatment, per permethrin or ivermectin. Thank you once again for the informative and entertaining podcast. If I win, he won last week, David. And uh, give it to someone else. All right, <laughs> <laughs> Dixon. I think we might just do that. Uh, Leland writes, "Dear Twip Triumvirate, I am writing to weigh in on the teenager with eosinophilic meningitis from episode one forty eight. As a private practice ID doc, I have enjoyed recently finding this podcast." and the related cousins in the microbe TV universe. They are an interesting diversion from the usual daily grind of leg cellulitis and contaminated blood <laughs> cultures. <laughs> here, here, an, here. An inside joke for ID fellows. A bright <laughs> so, future ahead. Yeah, exactly right. But you get paid for it. Come on, don't complain. Your teenager patient almost certainly has angiostrongylus infection. This is a human infection with the rat lungworm and can be present with the constellation of symptoms and findings that were mentioned. Fevers puritic rash, <clears throat> mild eosinophilia, paresthesias, and meningitis. She is not depicted as particularly toxic, which also fits the picture. I suspect the infection was contracted during the family trip to Hawaii. Mahalo. What a great souvenir. <laughs> and may have involved the salad mentioned, though it was not clear where this was consumed. Diagnosis is usually clinical unless a migratory larva happens to be seen in the CSF, though I believe serology is available. Treatment would be with steroids and repeated LPs for pressure and headache control. Perhaps this is the reason for the readmission teased at the end of the presentation. The aforementioned readmission did make me think that something more serious might be afoot. Strictly based on eosinophilic meningitis, nathostomiasis, or Bayless ascaris would have also, um, would also have be, uh, let's try this again, would have to also be in the differential. Though both typically cause more a severe CNS presentation and more significant peripheral eosinophilia. She doesn't really have good exposure history for either. I'm also leaving out coccidioides since this is not a mycological podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so my final answer 
is Andrew Strangelis. Thank you for the interesting consultation. I will continue to follow with you, and I'm always available to answer your questions about this or any other case. <laughs> <laughs> and there's no, he says in the parentheses, there's no charge. No, he actually didn't say that. <laughs> He's in Birmingham, Alabama. Mm. All right. Uh, uh, Sue's 13 degrees and sunny. That's exactly yes. right. Hello, dear TWIP hosts. My name is Susanna, and I work at a clinical microbiology laboratory in Stockholm, Sweden, where I'm one of the lucky ones that gets the chance to look at the beautiful parasites under the microscope. Outstanding. I found this podcast two months ago, and I absolutely love it. <laughs> These case studies are the best, and this is the first time I'm sending you my guess, hoping it's not too late. Mm. So here is my guess for the case study for TWIP 148. I believe this teenage girl has been infected by Angio strongulus cantonensis, the rat lungworm, which is the most common cause of eosinophilic meningitis. I have heard the name of this parasite before, but I have never really read a lot about it. So this is a bit new for me, which is fun. And here is what I found out. <laughs> Angio strongulus cantonensis is a nematode that has rats as its definitive host and snails and slugs as intermediate hosts. Some other animals, such as freshwater shrimp, crabs, or frogs, can get infected if they ingest snails or slugs or parts of them. Humans can become infected if they eat raw slash undercooked snails or slugs or raw slash undercooked frogs, crabs, or shrimps. It is also possible to get the infection by eating raw produce, such as lettuce, that contains small snails or slugs or parts of them. Most infected people don't get any symptoms or get very mild symptoms that don't last for long. When symptoms are present, they may include headache, stiff neck, fever, nausea, vomiting, photophobia, visual disturbances, and tingling or painful feelings in skin or extremities. So I know that this girl did not have all the most common symptoms for eosinophilic meningitis, but this will still be my guess because one, she has been to Hawaii where the parasite has been found. Two, she ate a salad that no one else in the family ate and it is a possible source for the infection. Three, even if she does not have all the typical symptoms for eosinophilic meningitis, the abnormal feeling in her legs is something that could be caused by the parasite. Four, she had increased white cells with 32% eosinophils in her CSF, which is a typical sign of eosinophilic meningitis. Okay, so I hope my guess is right, but even if it, even if it's not, it was very interesting to read about this parasite <laughs> that I did not know a lot about before. Thank you again for this awesome podcast. Best regards. Right. She's, by the way, this woman is writing from the epicenter for the invention of, um, oh, <laughs> Oh, no, please. You just had it, right? I do. It was around the tip of my tongue, the ELISA test. Really? Yeah. yeah, the ELISA test started there. Perlman and someone else did the test first to measure the amount of hemoglobin, or amount of IgG, rather, in, uh, I believe it was chickens. And then the next person to work on it, her name was Inger Lungstrom. And uh, she became a friend of mine because she worked on trichinella. And the second thing ever applied uh, to the ELISA test was the diagnosis of uh, trichinellosis. How oh, cool. Yeah, it was really interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, Engvall, the, the first author was Engvall and Perlman, and they, they published the results a long time ago. And uh, that happened right there in that laboratory. Neat. And she was a diagnostic technician at the time, too. She later on went and got her PhD and did a lot of work on trichinella, and we saw each other a lot. So it was great. shivang has got the last one. Sorry. He does. <laughs> Alan writes, Aloha na kumu, twip. <laughs> Very good. Warm greetings from the Big Island, where it's 28 degrees at the coast, 25 degrees where I live, and minus 7 at the top of the hill behind me. Goodness <laughs> gracious. <laughs> Some the hill they're talking about there, I imagine. The patient in your case study with pins and needles sensations in her legs progressing to more painful stabbing pains, along with eosinophilia in the CNS, sounds like it could be a neuroparasitic nematode infection. I would want to differentiate among nematodes such as Ballus ascaris, Nathostoma, Strongyloides, Toxocara, and Angiostrongylus. Mm -hmm. Nathostoma could have the pain, paresthesia, and strange rash from migrating larvae, but she doesn't have the history of raw fish consumption or visiting Thailand. Covert Toxocariasis. Patient is considerably older than a typical Toxocara patient, but Toxocara can cause a rash. No ocular liver or spleen involvement were described. Ballus ascaris and strongyloides don't typically cause paresthesias. 
However, having lived on the big island of Hawaii for three and a half decades, <laughs> wow, your patient's recent visit to our island and recollection of eating not raw fish but a lettuce salad made me think that this might be Angiostrongylus cantonensis, or rat lungworm disease. While we have probably a very, very low prevalence on our island, at least since the 1960s, we had 17 cases last year, including a few that made it to other islands in the U.S. mainland. I returned from Nepal last week to find we had our first rat lungworm case of 2018 about 100 meters from my office. That case seems to have resolved successfully, but neither steroids nor anti-helminthics appear to have been very helpful. And like any disease that can affect the brain, it has no specific core and sometimes causes long-lasting intractable pain. It has risen as a public health concern, even as the prevalence has remained low. The primary reservoir are rats, Norwegian rats, black rats, Polynesian rats, but apparently not mice or mongoose. Rats first pass the first stage larvae in their stool, which can affect several species of slugs, semi-slugs, and giant snails if they feed on the rat feces. People can't be infected by the first stage larvae, but can be infected by the third stage larvae if they should eat a raw slug or semi-slug. For instance, on a piece of incompletely washed lettuce, a young semi-slug is about the size of a piece of rice. There may be other routes of infection. A few third-stage larvae can be detected in slug slime, and they can live in the water for up to 72 hours. But my understanding is that human infection from contact with slug slime trails is not presently a confirmed route. Rats typically eat the infected slugs or semi-slugs and complete the nematode's life cycle, but in humans, the infection is a dead end often without symptoms or only mild flu-like symptoms. But if the nematodes invade the brain in CNS, then an infected patient typically presents with fever, headache, and meningismus, along with vomiting and migrating painful paresthesias. It certainly would explain the eosinophilia in the CNS, but my what-am-I-missing radar is going off, <laughs> as your patient did not present with a headache, and I'm not sure my guess of angiostrongylus really explains the itchy rash. Look forward to your guest diagnosis and discussion on case management. We'll use the Parasitic Diseases 6th edition with our primary healthcare students, should I win. Again, keep up this wonderful labor of love. Best podcast out there. Alan Robbins from Kona, Hawaii. All right. That was an unsolicited uh, endorsement, by the way. We did not know this person. Yes, we did. Uh, he writes on. in all the time. <laughs> we weren't supposed to say that. <laughs> We can edit this out. <laughs> but it's uh, fine to say we're the best podcast. Out there. In his opinion, we are. That's good. That's right. All right. Ten guesses. So wait, we we need to, Dixon, do you have your guess? Well, well, what are you course. thinking? No, are you I, going with the, the crowd, the yeah, populace? Afraid so. <laughs> yep. I, I, you know, this, this was a red flag that went up when you immediately said he is an affiliate in the UCNS because... Uh, I knew this guy, Ali Kata. I, I met him at several of the tropical medicine meetings in the past, and and he was a one-trick uh, pony. Basically, he would lecture about angiostrongylus uh, ad nauseum, but and he wrote treatises on them. And, he, and I'm not I'm not denigrating his work at all. He really did uh, bring this uh, infection to the fore, and as the result, it was discovered in. Um, some of the rats along the wharf in uh, New Orleans and uh, Paul Beaver also found it in uh, several slugs and lots of others and, and, and reckoned that this must have some infection rate in the American South as well. But uh, as far as I know, that was never uh, confirmed for diagnosis. But this is, a, I think, a typical case. I, I would say, yes, angiostrongylus. Now, now, Dick said, do you feel like you need any more sort of confirmatory um, testing, or you well, feel like you would just sort of say, you know what, this just <laughs> this is it, I'm I'm good? No, no, no. Of course, if there's something more definitive, like a PCR, for instance, or uh, you know, <laughs> anything short of a brain biopsy, um, or finding larvae in the CNS, of course, that would be definitive also. But I don't, I don't know of any tests for that. Uh, do you? Now, Shivang, I guess there was some follow up, right? I don't know if you want to. There was. Um, and just to take it back a few steps, when we were looking at the case in real time, we actually didn't have the CSF uh, study results yet. So we didn't know that it was eosinophilic meningitis. Ah. And so from our perspective, on the East Coast, not on the big island of Hawaii, we actually kind of examined uh, the symptoms more systematically and sequentially prior to having the CSF results. So we were trying to explain rash and neuropathic pain in a teenage girl and so we had a, a laundry list of infectious and post-infectious inflammatory yeah. neuropathy etiologies. And from a viral end, it could be different viruses that cause mono and chickenpox and herpes. 
Um, and so we sent a whole slew of uh, PCR and antibody testing for those viruses. Yeah. And then we thought about vector-borne illnesses, specifically from Hawaii, including leptospirosis and rickettsia typhi. Mm. Given the exposure in Hawaii, the headaches, the fever, the rash, and kind of extremity pain and some neurologic symptoms. Um, and of course, we thought about arboviruses and Lyme, since we're from a Lyme endemic area. Um, but this is all before we got the CSF PCR results. And so once we got to the stage of having that data and knowing that it was eosinophilic meningitis, then our differential narrowed down quite considerably. Is that when you obtain the case history, a piece of data for the salad <laughs> before or after? <laughs> before actually. Really? Um, yeah. That's uh, interesting. We asked about uh, um, any sort of like food exposures. Um, we focused mostly on kind of uh, raw or undercooked um, dairy, meat, fish, and sushi. Um, and then the salad, uh, huh. after we had the eosinophilic meningitis, we, probed that a little bit more. Yeah, sure. The, f the family was certainly uh, forthcoming with a lot of details. So the, the CSF PCR, how is that done with a, a family of primers for things you might find in there or one at a time? Yeah, so the specific CSF PCR, which I'll get to in a little bit, is um, for um, this particular um, species, the oh, Angiostrongylus okay. cantonensis. Um, ah. And it's not perfectly sensitive or specific, but uh, initially, all we had was a CSF pleocytosis, a lot of white cells, a lot of inflammation in the CSF, yeah. and most of those were eosinophils. And so we th went through mm -hmm. kind of thinking through what is the differential for eosinophilic meningitis. And sure. apart from angiostrongylus, we thought about nathostomiasis, mm -hmm. but she hadn't been to Southeast Asia, um, hadn't had the relevant exposure in terms of freshwater fish, yeah, yeah. ELA reptile um, exposure. She didn't have the skin findings. Her Her rash was kind of more bumps and flat areas of, of redness, but not the sort of migratory cutaneous larva migrans sort of thing you might see with nathostomiasis. And her initial imaging findings on MRI were normal, so that also right. led us away from nathostomiasis. Yeah, exactly. um, in terms of Bayless ascaris, um, she hadn't been hanging around raccoon latrines or eating earthworms on a dare. <laughs> good, good. <laughs> um, and so we felt like that was less likely. And she also didn't really present an extremis. Um, she was relatively um, non-toxic appearing is what we would say. Right. Um, and then in terms of non-parasitic causes, we thought about coccidiomycosis, um, but she hadn't been to yeah, the Southwest yeah. or Central yeah. and South America and didn't really fit that sort of pulmonary brain syndrome that you might see. Um, and again, this is a parasite podcast. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but you, you didn't know she'd be on it at this point. Uh, that's true. Um, uh, How helpful would that have been? <laughs> exactly. Uh, and then we thought about cattle bot flies and visceral myosis, um, but she didn't really have a furuncular rash. It was kind of more... Um, hmm. Wow. Uh, you covered the waterfront, so to non -specific. speak. Non-specific. So we, we thought about all the different causes. But not um, scabies. <laughs> but not scabies. <laughs> no, because when... Well, if you don't mind me interjecting here, the, the rash in scabies appears in areas where the scabies mites are not. Okay, so the itching mm. of the extremities wouldn't be appropriate for scabies. The itching should be between the webs of the fingers, mm -hmm. and oh. that wasn't there. So if you look at the chart that we have in our sixth edition, you can see quite clearly where the scabies mites live and where the rash is. Those are two separate places. Mm. So you, you would have had a complaint from the patient that they're, they're you know, they're always going like this with their fingers in between each other, just right, itching right. them. That, that, that should have, uh, I guess maybe we could mention that later, but uh, scabies is pretty rare anyway in, in a vacation venue in Hawaii. Yeah, and she, she was old <laughs> enough where that was less of a concern. Um, yeah. Uh, and yeah, it didn't really cost our mind too much. But um, in terms of, Going forward from thinking about eosinophilic meningitis, her exposure history and her symptoms really classically fit with angiostrongylus in our okay. literature review. And so the rash was the one kind of unusual feature, but everything else fit quite mm -hmm. nicely for that. So that was uh, our leading thought going forward. Um, and so we actually ended up starting empiric steroids uh, up front uh, once we had that as our, our leading thought. Um, but then the next night, um, and we ended up having conversations um, every night for the first few nights with um, colleagues from the Hawaiian Department of Health, um, including a working group on angiostrongylus. So um, <laughs> this included uh, Sarah Park, the state's epidemiologist, and Vernon Ansdell, who leads a working group on angiostrongylus um, in Hawaii. And so they were 
incredibly helpful in terms of providing us advice on sure. management, uh, diagnosis, um, and basically helped us um, with each bit along the way. And so they recommended actually starting albendazole, interestingly, oh, given the higher yeah. larval burden that they'd been seeing in recent cases in Hawaii, um, because of the semi-slug, the parmarian that uh, one of uh, the respondents mentioned having more of these L3 infective larvae. Um, and it, if you look closely at the literature on albendazole, there's no obvious harm to giving it apart from some case studies, but um, there was potential benefit. So after talking with the experts in Hawaii, as well as the patient and her family, we ended up starting albendazole. Um, and initially, a day into steroid therapy, the pain was actually getting worse before it ended up getting better. Mm. Um, we actually had uh, the pain team in the hospital, so a group of specialist doctors who um, advise on really severe pain that's outside the realm of um, normal pain. And they had to use a lot of different medicines to just treat her pain. Um, and it was so severe, in fact, that even the touch of a blanket was excruciating for her. So like gout. Hmm. It was part wrenching to watch. Um, but after a few days of steroids, about three or four days into the steroid course, her symptoms had gotten a lot better um, and she was able to go home shortly afterwards. So she ended up getting two weeks total of albendazole two weeks of steroids with a two-week taper after that, as well as a pretty impressive oral pain regimen. Um, and she ended up having pretty complete resolution of her symptoms by about two to three weeks oh, out from leaving the that's hospital. very fortunate. And since we did get CSF, um, we did um, send that for PCR for angiostrongylus mm -hmm. um, to the Hawaii DOH. And that test mm -hmm. was negative. Aha. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because there were no remnants of worms. Their DNA wasn't there, so you can't PCR it, right? Well, he had already treated, right? Is that the idea? Well, that or the infection rate was so low that uh, you didn't have any detectable organisms present at that Rising. Point. I guess the other, right, is the reality that, you know, this is a test that probably do doesn't quite have the use, you know, that other tests have. So, right. you know, what's the sensitivity? That's and, right. Mm -hmm. You know. You can get 100% in rats. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but this, what I'd like to say, though, is that Ali Kata, Dr. Ali Kata, left a legacy behind, which still is present today. So this uh, angiostrongulus uh, health team, so to speak, that you can go and consult with is as the result of his activity. So I, mm -hmm. I can't emphasize enough how indebted we are to the fact that he dedicated most of his adult life to uh, studying this disease. Yeah. yeah. Now, how... Soon into the therapy, did you take the CSF? We took the CSF um, before starting albendazole. Oh. That's important. Mm. Um, and actually before um, uh, starting steroids. So right. it was pre-therapy, so, and the symptoms had been going on for a couple weeks. So if the worms were there, but they hadn't died yet, and therefore hadn't released their DNA... It still would have been negative, even no, though she the, had an the active PCR, infection, right? the process, you extract the DNA. That's fine. Yeah, but there's no worms to extract. Right, so the CSF is cell-free? No. No, it's just CSF. You could you could pull worms out in the CSF with a needle, right? Yeah. For sure. And it, and could, but they didn't. Yeah. How do you know that? You don't know. No, no. <laughs> Wait, <laughs> if you look at the CSF, when you look at the CSF, you saw cells, right? Yes. But you didn't see any evidence of worms. No, there were no worm worm evidence of worms. Or, or, yeah. And if you look at kind of recent case series of angiostrongylus, like it's very infrequent that they actually yeah. see direct evidence yeah, of the exactly, worms. Exactly. Um, but the CSF PCR is actually imperfectly sensitive. Yeah. And this is where it was very helpful to have uh, our Hawaiian colleagues weigh in mm, because they felt the symptoms, the exposure history, Perfect. and the eosinophilic meningitis matched perfectly right. with angiostrongylus. So they said, ignore the CSF PCR it's imperfectly sensitive. Hmm. Even in folks that have documented hmm. infection and undergo treatment, it can wax and wane in terms of its positivity, which is not ideal, but yeah. it's what we exactly. have. And that is the only place you would be able to diagnose this infection in the person? Yeah, it turns out that serology is um, not super helpful because there's a lot of cross-reactivity hmm. um, uh, with um, other kind of related uh, nematodes. and there is one lab in China that does do some serologic testing, but 
you'd imagine that a lot of the folks in endemic areas are going to be yeah. uh, kind of occultly infected and serologic cool. test well, positive. One of the interesting things to point out, I know you will point this out too, <laughs> is that you don't have to go to Hawaii to diagnose this infection. They will come here. So this becomes a crossroads for travelers and their infections. And that's why New York City has so many people mm-hmm. in the professions mm-hmm. that know about these things. And that's why that's why we exist. We exist to make sure that this inf- this material doesn't disappear under everybody's clinical radar screen because, I mean, this was a chance admission, an emergency chance Absolutely. admission that turns out to be one of the most rare diseases possible in the United States. But, not, well, if you consider why not in the United States, of course it is. <laughs> <laughs> Only recently in the United States. <laughs> Mainland. Yeah, the point is that, that you have to think about all these things when you're an ID fellow in a place like New York City. Absolutely. So if this patient had gone to a different state with smaller population, I don't want to name any because I don't want to insult anyone. It may have been harder to diagnose it. That's correct. It might have, but I think that one thing that's useful in terms of a resource is just knowing that uh, there are folks with localized expertise and knowledge, in this case, Hawaii and their Department of Health, that you can refer to. And Luckily, the differential for eosinophilic meningitis is so... sure narrow that mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. now uh, what causes the the pins and needles and sh- stabbing pain this is just the general neuropathy that's caused by the parasite being in the csf yeah there seems to be a neurotropism for the l3 larvae in uh just as one of the uh responders was saying uh in uh in rats which are the definitive host it can go through all five um uh, stages of larval development. So the rats ingest the L3 larvae, it migrates to their CNS and develops into L4 and L5 forms, right. and then ultimately um, invades the vasculature and gets to the lungs where the eggs develop and form L1 larvae that... By the way, the L5 is actually up. an adult worm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sorry. Fair. Uh, and there then are they- very few things that I'm actually sure of, and that's one of them. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And then uh, they cough up the L1 uh, forms uh, into the GI tract, and then ultimately the rats pass that out. And then these intermediate hosts, um, the slugs, the semi-slugs, various mollusks, there are 50 different types of them, uh, basically take up the L1 larvae either by ingesting them or through their skin, and they develop into the L3 larvae and can come out of the the foot of the the slug or um, get coughed up uh, through their lungs. Um, and uh, those L3 larvae are the ones that are infective, and they can infect paratenic hosts like crabs and shrimp, um, as well as um, the rats, the definitive host, and yep. incidental dead-end hosts like humans. And in humans, uh, the L3 larvae um, are ingested into our gut and then have this neurotropism to the CNS, which I don't think is fully understood. No, it is. of course it isn't. Um, and then in terms of the symptoms that people develop, it, it seems to be uh, related to the inflammatory response to, to dead parasites themselves. And that's um, why you give steroids, right? Exactly. Sure. So do you know if the salad was prepared at home or eaten in a restaurant? It was a restaurant. Um, they mostly right. went ate out. Uh, they did do a little bit of cooking. Um, but to be fair, we don't know exactly what um, the food exposure was. All that we did know was there was some consumption of um, uh, salad that um, was uh, kind of locally sourced mm. and um, not eaten by other members of the family. Oh. I mean, that brings the question of what do you do to prevent? I mean, if you go to a restaurant, you would hope that it's well washed, right? But can can things can slip through, right? Of course. So do you, should you not eat salads at restaurants in Hawaii? <laughs> <laughs> And along with frogs and undercooked shrimp. <laughs> All of the above. Daniel, any thoughts? You know, I think one of the things that has come up a few times here is how rare this is. Um, so, you know, I think you can actually go ahead and eat salads in, in Hawaii. Yeah, I'm going to get a um, call from the Department of Tourism and say, hey. Yeah, you're going you're gonna to get, get in trouble. No, it's interesting. I um, One of the... Uh, what are what are those? Our panel of experts for um, parasites without borders. Uh, Johnny Yates actually is from Hawaii. He is he's on the rat lung um, mm. uh, angiostrongolus task force. 
Um, so the rat lungworm task force. So it was really funny. I, I emailed him about this case and he was like, oh, you're going to have to tell me more, but I have to run now. I'm headed to my, uh, you know, rat lungworm task force meeting. Exactly. And uh, <laughs> so th- there are not that many cases. I think you can safely eat salads. But you shouldn't eat slugs, right? In Hawaii. You, but you should avoid, I think in all, in all, you should avoid. He actually, it was funny. He, he emailed me back that he had seen a case or been involved with a case of four gentle, gentlemen and described as gentlemen, and they were um, sharing a, a kava beverage. I don't know if you guys, mm. you remember mm. we talked yeah. about that? We did. We did. Yeah, we, did. we remember. Yeah. I have my kava tea before I go to bed to help yep. unwind and relax after my stressful day. But apparently there's a more, um, uh, I guess, a, a beverage that has more of a cognitive impact. And <laughs> when these four gentlemen finished their, their kava drink, they noticed a slug in the bottom of the bowl, and oh. they actually, the four of them ended up, uh, getting rat lungworm infection. Was that a recent posting, wow. by the way? Wow! Uh, it was. I, I just got the email from Johnny, so I don't. I don't know uh, if they wrote it up or what they did. But uh, you know, they report all these, so they they keep yep. track. You're right. It's just they're they're just not that many. Which there, is, there was something on um, ProMed that came up recently that there were five people that were infected with angiostrongylus. And it is really that, rare. Yeah, it is rare. But when it happens, it happens in groups sometimes, right? Now. If I ate a slug here in New York, would not a problem. No, <laughs> only in certain places. So Hawaii places, is one. Yeah. So what, where else? Basically, there have been about three thousand total cases reported um, since the nineteen sixties, nineteen forties, when they first reported human mm-hmm, cases, mm-hmm. mostly related to raw snail exposure. And so, exactly. in some areas, like half of these cases are from Thailand, where raw snails are a delicacy, um, especially when you're going out having a beverage uh, with n- neurologic <laughs> um, effects. Yes. Um, it lowers your resistance to say no. <laughs> and so raw snails are delicacy there, um, and they're becoming more and more of a delicacy in other parts of Southeast Asia, Taiwan and China, um, and being farmed. And so in some of those areas that previously didn't have um, this disease in uh, Taiwan and southern China, there's more and more reports in the last couple of decades, and it's gradually spread to other tropical and subtropical areas. Um, Dixon, like you were mentioning, in the U.S., um, there have been cases not just in Hawaii, but also California and the Gulf Coast, like in New Orleans. Um, yeah, and the yeah. thought is that um, increased global trade with rats kind of hitching a ride on yeah. ships going all over the place yeah, right. uh, is part of it. Um, global warming and could play a role because humidity and temperature affect the larval viability. And um, the presence of slugs. Yeah, exactly. And Hawaii is really, really special because the, the semi-slugs on the Big Island Uh, really do have a lot of larvae. Um, Folks have looked at this uh, in recent studies um, uh, just within the last uh, 10 years, basically comparing the semi-slugs of Hawaii, the Parmarian martensi, to the Pila species in Thailand, the the more commonly eaten um, snail there. And basically, in the Pila species, there's about three larvae per snail, and only 5% of these are L3 larvae. And the median larval density in the Parmarian compared to three is 110 per mm. slug, mm. and 80% of these are L3. So if you do the math, it's basically a 500-fold increased burden of L3 infective larvae in these semi-slugs in Hawaii. So it's it really is a problem there. And just to highlight this, in twenty from 2001 to 2005, there were only 24 suspected cases of angiostrongylus from Hawaii. And in 2017 alone, there have been 50 suspected cases. Mm. Knows his stuff, doesn't he? I've been here since (laughs) 1971 on on point for this subject, and I've always, always been amazed at the thoroughness of our ID fellows. And you are an absolute stunning example, and uh, congratulations on (laughs) you know breaking through the diagnostic barrier first, but but also to research it right down to that level is just. it's it's a sign that uh, you're in the right place, and so and so am I. <laughs> no, no. Uh, Glenda Garvey used to be the person in charge of this kind of information, and I used to be in awe of her because she didn't leave any stone unturned, and you apparently didn't either. So you would have you would have gotten along very well with her. Now, Shivang, I think you were saying there was a second um, PCR they did of the CSF. Is that that's right? So she was actually readmitted. About a month after that first hospital admission, um, with new exacerbation of symptoms, she had headache, mm. tremor in her hands, and a diffuse itchy sensation that she described as not just like kind of how a rash itches, but something mm. a little bit deeper. Um, and it was basically in the setting of two changes. One was that she had 
recently completed her pain medicine and steroid medicine taper. Yeah, right. And then the second thing, unfortunately, was a new <clears throat> influenza infection. Hmm. Ah, dear. So two two variables had changed. We were unclear which was responsible for kind of tipping her over, but she ended up being admitted for pain and symptom management. And part of that involved getting a therapeutic lumbar puncture and restarting her steroid course. Um, and again, we talked with the Hawaii Department of Health, who uh, helped us out in terms of management and confirmed our thoughts that we wouldn't need to retreat with albendazole. Um, uh, the neurology team, interestingly, did get a second MRI on that admission. And this time, in contrast to the first MRI, there were actually some interesting findings um, of nodular meningeal enhancement, uh, mm-hmm. basically focal bits of inflammatory changes oh. on the outer covering of the brain. Yeah, the meninges. Um, uh, and uh, when we talked with the doctors in Hawaii, they said that this was nothing to be concerned about, just the expected course of evolution of the disease. Yeah. But not unsurprisingly, given where the disease occurs, there isn't a lot of data in terms of um, serial imaging uh, case series or anything of that sort. But since she did get the lumbar puncture, and again, it showed a white count of 515, an elevated opening pressure, so indicative of high oh. uh uh, intracranial pressure. Um, uh, and again, there were 27% eosinophils, so quite a eosinophilic predominance. And so we sent it again for CSF PCR of Angiostrongylus, hoping for the best. <laughs> and it was negative. Positive. Oh, it was all right, all right. So we had an answer, which was really uh, right. satisfying and important because we didn't want to lock into a certain diagnosis without. So. What is your feeling in terms of the course of this then? Uh, because albendazole apparently didn't work too well. Um, and it's also got some in, uh, anti-inflammatory activity, by the way. But uh, apart from the fact that it's an anti uh, helminthic as well, they didn't recommend uh, ivermectin because it wouldn't cross the blood-brain barrier, right? And yeah. so this worm actually developed somewhat before it died and induced these uh, granuloma. Do you think that we're looking at them? From I MRI? think so. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it's tough to say um, if the albendazole didn't work. Um, we know that it didn't seem to uh, impact her short term course. Exactly. But if you look at uh, some of the more recent case series from Hawaii, in particular, um, and in other parts of the world, the larval burden is really so high in Hawaii, and a lot of the symptoms can go on for uh, up to months um, yeah. in a lot of these individuals and it typically does end up being the headache and the neurologic symptoms uh, that end up the sense kind of abnormal sensory symptoms that kind of can persist for a while. How long was that ago from today that she came in for her second visit? It was about a month after the first uh, visit and she has now been out of the hospital for about three weeks and she's she's doing well on the mend. Okay. She's doing well off steroids. Yeah. She's on a steroid taper, so she's okay, probably fine. towards the end of that right. at this point. Um, uh, so I think doing well through a combination of factors. One is time and the sure. larvae dying off, um, the anti-inflammatory effect and decreasing ICP from the steroids, but also the repeat lumbar puncture, I think, uh, also helped her a lot symptomatically. And so going forward, there's not a lot of risk of anything else happening? There's not going to be any more larvae in her any, they probably all died. They, they, they all sh- died. The yeah. larvae should be dead. The symptoms can persist, um, mm. uh, sometimes for months up to a year, um, and it's usually headaches and some of these kind of peripheral sensory changes. Mm-hmm. All right. It's kind of wild, right? You think about just the mistake, you know, or the yeah, accident you're, of, you know, you ingesting this with the, you know, making that fateful decision to have the salad and, yeah. you know, and then here you are for months to a year of having exactly. um, the sequelae. It's really tough. It's a mistake on multiple levels. She made a mistake, but the parasite is not in the right place. <laughs> yeah, it, didn't get want, out. it didn't want to do this. It doesn't want to do <laughs> it. And I would argue that <laughs> poliomyelitis is a mistake. The virus does not want to be in your spinal cord because it can't get out again. Right. And the only and polio is a great intest GI virus, it replicates like gangbusters and goes yeah. efficiently from person to person, but once it gets into your CNS, yep. dead end done. Mistake. So it's, I think, in fact, every virus that gets in the CNS yeah. is a mistake because they can't move on to another host from the CNS. Yeah, but yeah. that's a 
discussion for another show. I'm sorry. I'm That's curious. okay, but I, I have a title for this show, and it's called Stranger in a Strange Land, because that was Wonderful. Harold W. Brown's stranger favorite expression. Stranger in a Strange Land. That was a favorite expression. This is a stranger in a strange land, and uh, you get strange okay. results Very as good. a result. Uh, that was a lovely case. Yeah. Please. Yeah. yeah, I think we did a good job, actually, of, of throwing the you life. Have, you have to come back. I- yeah, I was just going to say, come back. <laughs> Well, right. you have obviously, other things to talk about malaria, right? Absolutely. Yeah. You, do you I'd love can, to come back? So you're a parasitologist, basically, right? Yeah. Basically. <laughs> come on. And you're right here. <laughs> you have no you excuse. Know, right across the street. You got to come. Have no excuse whatsoever. But, yeah, we'd love to have you. And by the way, the uh, young lady in in Dublin with the worms, the lungworms, and the uh, mm-hmm. badgers, the frozen badgers. Yeah. <clears throat> so I tweeted and I said, "This is a lovely uh, video. We're talking about it on Twip." So she said. I have since found that all 78 lungworms collected have live larvae in them, and all of them were frozen at minus 20 for 6 to 15 months. That's in the end, easy. there'll be only parasites and cockroaches. Oh, my God. Isn't that <laughs> the great? The question for her is that do badgers hibernate? Do badgers hibernate? I asked first. Do you want me to ask her? <laughs> yeah, would you Dixon please? wants to know. It's like 11 p.m. there, but That's we'll right. see if she's really... Because if they do, then this, this might explain why they're still alive, because... Uh... They possess in their muscle tissue. Oh, an antifreeze? Yeah. That's right. Daniel, there he goes with the antifreeze. So should we mention that they do not hibernate? <laughs> they may become a little less active in winter, but they don't actually hibernate. They don't lower their body temperature to just sleep they, it off? They do not hibernate. Okay. Okay. So all right. You you and your muscle antifreeze, you can get me in trouble all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking for explanations here, okay? So we had 10 guesses. You want to pick a winner? Yeah. Shall we pick a winter a winner? We All right, we're gonna do a random number generation between one and ten. Are you ready? We are. Boom. <laughs> number one. Wow. Ta-da. Number one. And number one as they said it was Trichina. <laughs> Trichinella. <laughs> Spiralis. It's okay. Jerry. Not so Jerry one. is the winner. We'll get him a signed book. Congratulations, Jerry. And Jerry, send me your address. <laughs> Twip at microbe.tv. If you are not in the U.S., then send also your phone, which is required for international shipments. But I will not call you. No. Dixon. Yes, sir. Do you have a hero? I do. Besides now, Daniel. I know he's your hero. No, he is, actually. <laughs> I must tell you that he is. He's so the last time we did Bruce, as I recall. Jack Bruce from the no, band. Not Jack Bruce. No, 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 no. You and I are the only two who would know Cream, right? <laughs> Maybe. Daniel, do you know the rock group Cream? I have heard of them. A lot of people <laughs> Everyone knows know them. You don't? You do? Right. But this guy's, the Bruce's uh, first name is not that. It's David Bruce. We did David Bruce last time. So we're moving down the alphabet. And today's hero is Alexander Joseph Emil Brumt. He's an MD. His dates are 1877 to 1951. So he actually enters the modern era of parasitology. So, Alexander Joseph Emil Brumt was an accomplished zoologist, besides being an MD, working on many species of parasites over his lifetime. He published papers on malaria in birds, Plasmodium gallinaceum, Setsi fly biology, Leishmaniasis, Trypanosoma cruzi, Onchocerca volvulus, Blastocystis hominis, and made the distinction between pathogenic Antamoeba histolytica and its harmless protozoan doppelganger, Entamoeba dispar. So this is a very brief description of his accomplishments because you'll see his name associated with lots of parasit- parasitic disease literature and lots of basic zoological parasite descriptions as well. So he's uh, he's earned the title of hero from two different perspectives. One is from a medical perspective and the other is, of course, from a zoological perspective. So our hats off to Alexander Joseph Emil Brumpt for being able to be featured in our book. And as you were reading, I got a little notification on Instagram from one of our um, guessers, David P., who won last time. Ah! He sent a picture of the signed frontispiece of the book. Look at that. And he said, uh, happy to have received the signed copy of Parasitic Diseases in a TWIP raffle. This will definitely come in handy in my career as a parasitologist. Thanks for the informative and entertaining podcasts. 
Isn't well, this amazing? We aim to please. That's I mean, this cool. is a new- I'm just impressed that you're on Twitter and Instagram. And- <laughs> for, for an old guy, you're, you're saying. <laughs> I'm not on Twitter and Instagram, so. Well, you know, this is the new era of education. This is That's how right. it works. Right. And uh, I love it. I totally love it. Cool. All right. Uh, we have a, a really cool paper, but you have a snippet, Dixon, right? I do have a snippet that I found, of course, in my all-time favorite um, published magazine called Cosmos Magazine. It's published from Australia. It's it's quite a good uh, summary of some basic biological phenomena. And in this case, what they were looking at were coprolites of dinosaurs. And they found recognizable egg shapes and cyst shapes of common parasites, which we know about today. And they conclude from their um, examination that uh, ascarid-like parasites – Trichurus like parasites and amoeba histolytica like parasites infected dinosaurs. And they also found hmm. evidence for puncture wounds through the te- cheek muscles of Tyrannosaurus rex, indicating they may have been infected with myiasis like organisms, which could have occurred, let's say, after a, a scuffle between T. rex and, let's say, Triceratops over a carcass, although Triceratops was a, 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 an herbivore, so I'll take that back. Perhaps a Velociraptor. <laughs> and, you know, then they get injured, and you can see they had broken bones and they had all kinds of other injuries. And you know, we just took our little grandson over to the Museum of Natural History this last weekend. And he looked up, he's two and a half years old, he looked up and he says, Dinosaur Rex. <laughs> Dinosaur Rex. <laughs> Dinosaur <laughs> Rex. And we just loved it. We just absolutely loved it. So kids are fascinated by this, but adults too. And this just goes to show that um, the further back in evolution you look, the more common you find things that are still with us today. That's what I liked about it. Yeah, it's very cool. I should tell the story of a, uh, actually one of my roommates in college took his son who just was so excited about dinosaurs to the Museum of Natural History, right? Yeah. And the son is so excited. He's going to see dinosaurs and he goes in and he breaks into tears, turns to his daddy and says, daddy, they're all dead. <laughs> That's right. That's exactly right. Oh, I have an add on for this too. I think I might have mentioned this before when we talked about Trichinella, but the term dinosaur means terrible lizard. Mm-hmm. which is incorrect, of That's course. Right. And it was coined by none other than the director of the British Museum. All right? So this this gentleman, um, whose name <laughs> is... <laughs> That's right. I'm, I'm fishing for his name. And I you used want me to, to look it up? No, no, no. I, I know this. Who Just made give, up... Give me a break Ooh. here. Richard Owen. Richard Owen. Okay. And Richard Owen... Was yeah, Richard Owen is in Wikipedia he saying was that. Totally against Darwinian evolution. And yet here he was describing all these gigantic, uh, skeletonized uh, mm. monsters that lived a long time ago and uh, had no idea of how old they were. So he didn't uh, dare guess about that. But uh, he's also credited with having discovered Trichinella. <clears throat> so we've got this uh, very interesting juxtaposition of uh, a learned gentleman who had deep. Uh, religious convictions and refused to give them up. And he thought Darwinian evolution was the defeater of all those uh, convictions and therefore fought them tooth and nail all the way through his life and, but is responsible for having named dinosaurs what they are today. So they're really terrible birds, right? <laughs> well, they're, they're neither one of those things. Birds evolved from dinosaurs, but dinosaurs and lizards, they split off a long time ago. And yeah. lizards remained lizards and dinosaurs remained dinosaurs. So they, very interesting. Dinosaurs were warm blooded. They had hollow bones. Take a look at them. They had all the features of a bird. That's why we know birds evolved from them, we think. And they they were warm blooded. And that's as opposed to reptiles, as we know, are not warm blooded. So there you go. And they had parasites. Oh, they all had parasites. And they had <clears throat> viruses. Those are parasites. All right, Rachel replies, nope. Badgers, Badgers do not. They do not hibernate. They do show reduced activity <laughs> slash foraging in uh-huh. cold winters, but no hibernation. Okay. And she sent Thank a picture of a cute <laughs> badger. <laughs> you get a confirmation of this one. That's right. That's great. Cute badger. All right. Terrific. Don't touch the badger. Right. Uh, yeah, that's yeah, right. There's a, yeah, there's a cute badger. Yeah, badgers are really quite... The, the, the most intelligent animal in Africa is thought to be the honey badger. It thought is, it was humans. No. Yeah, we're, the, we're the dumbest, actually. I guess besides we? humans. But <laughs> all of the um, 
all the people that talked about honey badgers were absolutely astounded with their ability to figure things out, like getting a door open or finding food in a locker and stuff like this. And so uh, they're quite amazing. They've, they've actually got a film of honey badgers, a single honey badger being surrounded by a pride of lions. Mm-hmm. And it, it had escaped by simply intimidating the uh, female lions. So <laughs> quite amazing, actually. We were very impressed with them. And they have a distinct odor as well that uh, is a little bit like a skunk. So you can actually smell them for quite a distance before you actually run across them. All right, Dixon. Enough about badgers. Enough of that. Are we, have, are we ready for we have, our paper? paper? We are. We have a paper now. I want to warn everyone. We have 30 minutes to do this because I have to leave at 630. <laughs> oh, there's no and problem. There's plenty of time. This is a nature communications paper that Dixon is going to lead us through, right? We are. I I'm mean, I am. My, I'm going to keep my mouth shut, right? I wouldn't keep it that shut. Agrochemicals increase risk of human schistosomiasis by supporting higher densities of intermediate hosts. Correct. First author is Neil Halstead. Sec. Last author is Jason Rohr. And this is from... University of South Florida, University of California, Berkeley, Monash University, right. RMIT University, Emory University, Stanford, University of Florida, Gainesville, University of Tampa, Oakland University, and the Pasteur Institute. It's high-powered. What's an agrochemical? Okay. Is it made from oil? Uh, it can be. Okay. But agrochemicals are used to give domesticated plants an advantage. Not in vertical farms, though, right? We don't need them. Exactly. So, But what you're looking at here is a top-down and bottom-up analysis of herbicides and crustacean killers. What does that mean, top-down and bottom-up? Well, they're looking at the snail as the target here, okay? Because the okay. snail is the intermediate host for schistosomiasis. So they're looking for agrochemicals that encourage the survival of snails, in an agrochemical in an agricultural setting and because agriculture needs to suppress weed growth mm-hmm. right and it also needs to suppress higher forms of life taking advantage of their crops mm-hmm. they use two different sets of chemicals they use herbicides at the bottom and they use um, all right bottom means that's what the snails eat that's right yeah. or that's what the Top means those are the, the competitors for the crops themselves. So they I don't understand. want a weed coming in. I just want in. you to explain top down and bottom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. So, <laughs> so this group hypothesized that the increase in agricultural mm. activity throughout Central Africa, uh, as the result of an increase in human population, will um, necessitate the the use of agrochemicals in order to get agriculture to actually work because mm-hmm. there's a lot of competition for the crops that they plant all right so it, it, this is true in this country too but there's it's nothing like it is in Africa because you have know, elephants competing for these things as well but what they looked at is aquatic environments where these snails actually live and so they've got uh, Astrolorbus globaratus which is the one that they concentrated on most, but there's a Bulimus snail species as well that they looked at. So there are a variety of species of snails living throughout Africa, which will either go up or down in population, depending on which agrochemicals are used. And they had no idea of which way to Mm -hmm. look at this. So they constructed a metacosm. What's that? So the mesocosm, I meant to say mesocosm. A mesocosm is an experimental setup that's halfway between an indoor laboratory highly controlled situation Mm -hmm. and an outdoor natural situation unaltered. Okay, so they set up these uh, artificial ponds. It's basically a tank, right? Exactly. Really big Kitty pool. Exactly right. (laughs) <laughs> that they could, <laughs> and they could, they could control how many snails go into each one, and they could control how many crayfish, which are predators for the snails, go into each one, and the giant water beetles that they put in as well, and the amount of algae that they seeded these ponds with. And they could alter the situation depending on the pond. 60, 1,200 liter This is exactly, tanks. it's a matrix. Amazing. It's huge. You, know, you set up a matrix. And I don't know you, where this was done. <laughs> this was done just the south Tampa, of Tampa. Florida. Tampa, yeah. Florida. This is the University of Southern... South Florida. I mean, University. that's where the aquaria were. That's correct. Yeah. This is a multi exactly. place. Plus, region. it's a uh, it's a tropical region, a semi tropical region, so it, it favors the growth of these snails and survival in a in a so here's the long term situation. I make sure please, I understand. Please, please, please. So we have the snails, which are hosts of the cercaria, right? 
That sounds right. Tricharia infect the snails, which can eventually... No, the other way, it's the myricidia that infects myricidia. the snails. The scary are given off by the snails. And then they infect people. Correct. And the snails eat <coughs> algae. They do. So if you kill the algae, you would decrease the snails. But if you increase the algae, which ah. could be an effect, then the snails could. That's but then right. there's a predator of snails. There is. Which you could either stimulate or kill by these chemicals. That's of right. course, you could figure out the effect on the snail, right? Okay. That's what we're looking That's at That's correct. And, and so, the, the what are the agrochemicals? Well, one of them is called atrazine. And, and atrazine is a... Um, it's a, a, f- a fungal slash herbicide <laughs> chemical that's widely used throughout the central northern part of the United States to suppress weed growth. In farms. Yeah. But as a result, it, it, it induces teratogenic effects in, in uh, amphibians. So one of the telltale uh, way to tell whether they're using atrazine or not is mm-hmm. to do a sample in a pond for three-legged and five-legged frogs. Truly. Because that's what happens when they're exposed to this, even in low numbers, so low amounts. So that in Europe, atrazine has been banned, totally. In this country, we're still doing experiments to see if it's okay. Do we do we have any sense that it's affecting us? Because maybe there's traces well, in the plants you know, that we're eating. Right? Vincent, it's a remarkable <laughs> question you've just asked. Because how would we know unless, of course, we started to ingest higher quantities of atrazine and then found out there were teratogenic effects in other groups of animals as well. Apparently, you mm-hmm. can feed a lot of this to mammals and you don't see much activity. Okay. But nonetheless, and All then right. there's another set of um, chemicals that they use to control. Um, Predators. In this case, it was uh, crustaceans, and they're using them to suppress crabs and, and crayfish. That's the chlorpyrifos. <laughs> That's right. So what is that used for usually? Well, I, I actually don't know, to be honest, because I, I have never heard of that chemical before I read this paper. So I, I assume that in Africa, the situation is a little bit different than it is in other places. And this well, chlorpyrifos chemical- is... Uh- Killing they're, they're, insects and worms. Insects, so, yeah, oh. they're organophosphates. So I, was, I once had horrible. the uh, misfortune, right, of being in Nepal during what they call the suicide season, oh, where the the men, young men, um, proposition the young ladies, and when they are turned down, um, a lot of them will actually ingest the chlorpyrifos, oh, and they get this organophosphate where it affects acetylcholine and uh, miserable. Oh, brother. Uh, Oh, but yeah, so this is widely used in a lot of parts of the world mm-hmm. as basically a way of of killing the things that might um, affect you know what we don't want. So sort of that top down effect. Exactly, that we're exactly right. And so what they did was they set up all these uh, tubs or these uh, you know, um, tanks, sixty tanks. gallon tanks of mm-hmm. experiment, and each one had a different thing in it, and they did a, and a, a matrix of all these chemicals and, and all snails. these snails. They have zooplankton. Predator, they had zooplankton. They algae. Had, they had crustaceans, and they varied the amount of each of the chemicals, and they evaried. sounds like fun. It. It actually is a lot of fun, but it's a lot of work. I mean, this is you're looking at a lot of work here. And they predicted that if you eliminated uh, weeds, but they also sorry, they also added that, schistosomes, right? They did, which was a little bit. They just added them to the water. Well, yeah, you know, in, because at different time points. Yeah, if any, if they wanted to know whether these chemicals they were affected collected from hamsters, the sicaria. eggs, and they were added to the mesocomen, mesocomb. Mesocosm. So the eggs put in the water. What would happen to them? They'll the hatch. The mericidia will come out and they'll infect the snails. Okay. So they wanted to know whether any of these chemicals had an effect on the infectivity of schistosomes yeah. for the snails. Of course, if it did, then maybe you could justify the use of the chemical because you could say, well, it's a schistosome control measure. Right. But it's, it's actually not the case. They n- no, had no, no effect whatsoever. Because right. when they pulled the snails out, they looked for... Schistosomes in them. They look right. for sicaria being shed as a result of uh, the infection. And they didn't find any effect of these chemicals on the sicaria either. Mm-hmm. Too bad. It's too bad, yeah. <laughs> it's really, yeah. Either way, you would have been a, a winner. But in this case, you're a double loser because uh, uh, eliminating the competition for algae, which the herbicide did, allowed the, the algal growth to go crazy, and that fed the snails. Wait, why did that happen again? Well, they killed off the higher plants. Got it. So more late. So the algae were not touched by this, right? And that created a rich food source for the snails. So they actually increased in numbers as a result. The top down food web. That's a food chain. Chain. It's It's a a chain. It's not a web because it's not complicated enough. But from the top down, they killed off the predators, 
Okay. And then they said, well, wait a minute, maybe the snails can hide in weeds. We haven't allowed for that yet. So that's, they put some weeds in some of these. Pond. It didn't matter. The, <laughs> the crayfish and the fish found those snails like crazy, and they fed on them because that's their food. And they're, they're what was killing the the crayfish? The, the second chemical that you mentioned, the or one that organophosphate. The organophosphate. It's a neurotoxin, basically. It's mm-hmm. a, and it, it, it kills off mosquitoes, yeah. larvae of mosquitoes, and things like this. But crayfish have nervous systems as well. Snails do too, but they're not as sensitive to this as the uh, crayfish. So. And the crayfish, by the way, have been introduced into Africa mm-hmm. as a control measure for these snails. It's a natural control yeah, measure. Yeah. So, and then the, the <sighs> runoff is killing them. <laughs> exactly right. I mean, it's a maddening story when you look at these results and and think, well, where does this leave Africa in terms of its agriculture? Well, let me initiatives? let me cast some devil's advocates into this. First Please. of all. Do we know that these chemicals or related ones are actually in the waters near farms in Africa? We do. We do know this. Yes, we do. They're commonly used. They're right. very common. And fertilizer, too, by the way. I didn't mean to leave that out because, I mean, you have to encourage the growth of the crop. Yeah, that's right. The fertilizer right. stimulates what? Algae Algae. Growth? Sure. Yeah. It's got tons mm. of nitrogen and phosphate, and that's the limiting factor of algae growth and, and, and iron as well, but it's mostly uh, organic nitrogen. Could it be? Another devil thrown into the mix. Go ahead. That in nature it's more complicated, and this wouldn't have. Maybe there are other components no. that they didn't put in them. I'm not saying that. No, but you're you know, right. In nature, wanna... this would never happen. But this is not nature because we have eliminated nature by our agricultural initiative, right? We've, mm. we've stripped it bare and just put in the thing that we want, like corn or wheat or millet or rice, and we want everything else to die. Everything. We want all the invertebrates, all the plant life, except the one we plant to die. Mm. That's what's wrong with outdoor agriculture because it's not an ecological situation. It's an anti-ecological situation. Well, humanity is not an ecological situation. (laughs) We just destroy everything. It's farming. (laughs) So what's the solution to this? Well, the solution is uh, to either agree to to use organic farming methods, Mm -hmm. which don't involve the use of agrochemicals at all, or farm in another way. Would that be like indoor farming? It would be, in fact. You know, you <laughs> or could, maybe vertical? Could we do vertical <laughs> farming? You know, I didn't mean to make this a topic for discussion or this paper, but this is certainly going into my references every time I give a talk on this and write a paper. This is it's lovely. very good evidence. It's a great argument for that, indoor farming. That right? you shouldn't be doing this because you'll get increased in schistosomiasis wherever you do it. And it's too bad because they're damming up lots of rivers in Central Africa as well to create reservoirs. Right. So they can farm more because the water is a limiting factor here, right? And once you eliminate that as a limiting factor, you can do these things, but Mm -hmm. it's it's wrong to do them here because in other places throughout the world, they don't have these kind of problems. So would it be a good study to to monitor the incidence of… Schistosomiasis oh. as these farms increase in No birth. question, no question. Yeah. And, and, and I've already done things like that in places like China where they built the Three Gorges Dam, for mm-hmm. instance. Mm-hmm. The, the reservoirs that they created behind that increased the range for Schistosoma japonicum by uh, crazy amounts. So agriculture has had a damaging effect. And, and you're, you studied malaria, right? How, how about looking at malaria in terms of this also? I mean, this... this the same issues, more standing same issues. water... Sure, but we've got a chemical that will actually kill mosquito larvae. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe, maybe you just get lucky and only schistosomiasis increases and malaria doesn't. Right. As the result of using agrochemicals, but that's not a great trade off, to be honest. Yeah. And don't, re- don't forget that this also drains into the surrounding natural setting. So that's where Vincent's uh, big concern is what are you going to do with, with all these natural ecological relationships that get affected mm-hmm. by these horrible agrochemicals and you can see what happens in the ocean already when they wash down through the mississippi river for instance and they go out through the into the gulf of mexico they induce huge algal blooms as the result mm-hmm. of the sure. nitrogen sure. fertilizer that's sure. left over after the plants take what they want is is africa able to do indoor farming though sure they can they can if they want they can do anything they want basically they can do agriculture i mean that's something that's uh obviously driven by uh, technology as well. These are not random farms. I mean, they have 
very neatly laid out rows. They have great soil in, in East Africa mm. because they have uh, you know, 25 layers, 25 foot layers of topsoil. <laughs> Basically, it's volcanic ash all the way down and it's very rich. The only thing they don't have is water. So if you used an indoor farming situation, mm. uh, you could save all kinds of water. You wouldn't have these worries at all. And you would never get tristosomiasis from an agricultural initiative. So there's lots. And I found a lot of interest in Africa, actually, to uh, talk about this idea. I hope I'm not so, the only one. I'd be worried that <coughs> the powers that are involved in deciding would say, well, we don't want to bother. We just want to do business as usual. We don't really care about people. We just want to make money. Right. Right. Sorry to tell you, but it's that's yeah. you're absolutely right. That is an attitude, and that's an attitude that has to be um, counteracted with a better argument. I'm we, surprised that this wasn't suppressed. It's ah, well, just it's, like tobacco <laughs> information was suppressed. For you know, years, of course. Right? <laughs> well, this this information came out in nature, but look where the authors are from. Okay, so they're they're not from Africa. No, basically. they're from U.S. and Australia, right? and <laughs> exactly. France. Exactly. So um, exactly. But this is really interesting. It totally cons- yeah. Yeah. And it fits in with what you're been yeah. thinking about lately. I mean, I get right? my inspiration from articles like this, and uh, it gives you very ammunition cool. to go forward. It also has some very complicated mathematics at the end, <laughs> which I was totally unfamiliar with because that's not my specialty. I thought you would explain that to us. Yeah, I, I was hoping you wouldn't ask. On this page, there are these series <laughs> uh, formulas one through eight. I don't understand how they derive four from three. Can you tell me? <laughs> no. Okay. Well, I mean, it would take a long time, Vincent. All right, Don't we you, don't have to. You have to get finished at 6.30, you said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Daniel, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, I just thought Shabang and I would go through the derivation of R sub zero. Excellent. <laughs> no, no, no. You take the R it's a complex take the set of differential equations. By the way, they did con- calculate R naught, right? Yeah. Which is the the uh, likelihood that a infected host will transmit to a, That's another correct. host. That is a good episode. So under the norm, under the the, these tanks without any addition of chemicals, the R naught was 3.6, the expected number of mated worms produced by a single mated female. Right, right. And the addition of snail predators yeah. reduce R naught below they one. They do. That's true. Which is what you were saying. That's why they introduced That's right. them. That's and right. then when you add the uh, chlor. Purifos, it goes up 10 times. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. You get rid of the predators, you deregulate the population, and you have a runaway situation, basically. That's what Amazing. you get. Yep. This reminds you know, me. Go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, yes, it was, um, you know, this is sort of a challenge because you have in the last um, 30 years the interesting, despite HIV, despite everything else that's going on, <laughs> the population of Africa has doubled. Correct. And so mm-hmm. you have twice as many people who want to eat. And if you look at the areas of Africa where they've introduced um, pesticides, at this point, you're actually seeing increased um, harvest. So there's a sort of a simple idea of, wow, we get pesticides, we increase food production. Once we have adequate food production, we can yeah, help these countries move forward in the developmental um um, I guess spectrum, so that they can then become more advanced, more industrialized. Hopefully, get out of this cycle of poverty. But you're struggling in a situation where there's consequences to that. So I think it's a challenge. Um, That's right. You know, I'm not sure everyone is using pesticides in Africa to make money. I think a lot of people are doing it to try to feed people. And this is important studies like this to show that there can be untoward um, consequences to that. That's correct. The one. The one. Caveat advantage, and it's not an advantage, is extreme poverty because people that are extremely poor can't afford these chemicals, so they won't use them right away. But big commercial farming operations Mm -hmm. have to use these. And those are the ones that don't care what happens to the people. They actually just go ahead. Sure, They they say at the end here, they don't mention indoor farming as as an alternative. They they say, you know, farming practices that minimize runoff and advances in the use of snail control agents – and mm-hmm. identify new chemicals that can be used without increasing sale densities. I mean, this is all. Yeah. You can do indoor farming right now. You well, can. this is pretty much a future this thing. No question. I don't know why they didn't think of that. Um, maybe I didn't review the paper. <laughs> but it, you should, it should be one of the new solutions to no, this that's issue. True. Right? I, I that, totally agree. And, and they will in future uh, years, not too distant future. They will be talking about that as well. I'm Look sure. at this, a paper that connects indoor farming and parasitology. How about that? There you go. Nice. So do we have time for a case? I don't uh, know if we yeah, do. Yeah, we have or... 10 minutes. Can you do it in 10 minutes? Uh, yes. Definitely. Yes. All right. 
So uh, I, I will tell people ahead of time, our listeners are going to, I've got sort of a theme here that I'm going to be starting. I've done <laughs> this before. All right. This is a, uh, and I, I guess I should tell people, I don't know if people know, I just got back uh, a couple days ago from Panama. I was down in Panama for a week, um, back working with the Nebe, the indigenous uh, pre-Columbian people up in the archipelago by the uh, Costa Rican border. And this is a case that I just saw this week. This is a 31-year-old man, and he is concerned about an ulcer on his leg. Uh, the ulcer is painless. It's about four centimeters in diameter with raised borders, a surrounding area that is hard and slightly different in color from the rest of the leg. It's a little bit reddish. Um, this young man reports that he feels well, but is concerned that this um, this is not resolving. I uh, said that the ulcer um, started off as a little bit of a, a bump, we'll call it a papule, and this slowly enlarged and it ulcerated, and now um, the ulcer has gotten to its present size. It's been there for at least a month. Um, other than this, he, um, healthy guy, no prior medical things, he actually has diabetes in his mother. Um, he doesn't take any medications. He works, at the, works in the fields with um, the machete. Uh, he lives with his family. Uh, he actually reports some social drinking and that he smokes one to two cigarettes per day. Um, as mentioned, he lives in one of these isolated native uh, villages on one of the islands in this archipelago in northern um, Panama, right near the border with Costa Rica. It's on the Atlantic side. Lots of animals, lots of insects. The way the homes are in this area is they're, they're raised up a little bit, and there are slats, and there's a little bit of a gap between the slat, and this sort of works when things spill or maybe the young children don't, you know, they have some accidents, let's say. Things can kind of fall between the boards. Um, when he's seen, he doesn't have a fever, blood pressure 150 over 70, heart rate in the 70s, breathing comfortably in the low teens. He is a uh, healthy, athletic young man, um, and he appears in good health except for this ulcer on his left leg. Uh, the ulcer, as he describes, is about four centimeters. I think he pronounced that word differently. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, it is non tender, you know, pushing around the edge of it. It doesn't hurt him. Uh, the base of the ulcer is, um, is red, uh, doesn't, no purulent material, doesn't, no obvious sort of sign of uh, sort of, I guess I'll say purulent um, area there. The borders are raised, but they're not undermined. Um, this area around the edge um, feels hard. Uh, there's no S char, no scab over this wound. And then I'm going to throw something in a little bit different. So I, I did a dermoscopic examination of the periphery of this lesion. Um, and there is, as described, there's erythema um, extending. There are these small yellowish teardrops, and there are a few white starbursts seen when I look under the dermoscope. Questions? What was that last one? Te yellowish teardrops and what? And small white starbursts. It's kind of candy, right? I was just going to say that. It's exactly <laughs> what it is. Okay. Any bad habits? He uh, drinks so, social drinking and smoking, that's it? Yeah, a little bit of drinking, yep. This man is single, right? This man is uh, single. And what does he do for, I mean, again, is he just hunting and gathering or is So he, he actually works um, in the field. So um, a number of them will work in the fields with the machetes and basically helping with, you know, sort of crop management. Uh, it, it's very- Sugarcane it's, mostly or? Um, some is sugarcane, some are some other crops that they, um, they okay. tend. It, it's just sort of just, a, I'll say a little bit above a subsistence level in okay. these places. So all their water is collected from runoff and uh, no electricity. Right. Well, that's pretty straightforward. I'd it is. Say. You got it. I think so. Oh, okay. Any questions, Siobhan? No. <laughs> Any answers? You got it too. <laughs> no answers. No, no answers yet. <laughs> <laughs> it's for next week. <laughs> it's for next week. That's oh, right. next time. All right. Uh, next time. That's right. Okay. So that'll do it. Twip one forty nine micro tv slash twip. Send us your your guesses. Twip at microbe tv. And if you want to send us your money as well, microbe.tv slash contribute. Shivang Shah has been our guest today. He's here at Columbia University Medical Center. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me on. Have fun to have. Come back sometime. 
Daniel, Daniel Griffin is at Columbia University Medical Center and ParasitesWithoutBorders.com. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, pleasure as always. Dixon de Pommier is at TheLivingRiver.org and ParasitesWithoutBorder.com. Borders.com. Thank you, Dixon. My pleasure. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. The music on TWIP is by Ronald Jenkins. Thanks to him and to ASM for their support. You've been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another TWIP is, is parasitic. parasitic.